Okay, this is part nine. Yes. Next week I'm going to end this. Of your one-part series. Out of my one-part <laughs> series. Well, you spoke it into existence. You said you can't do just one. I said it's too good. You got it. There's so, too much to be said about I that. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. I know. I anyway. do too. I do too. So, but uh, this is part nine. Change your thoughts. Change your life. And today we're going to talk about removing the accusation. So let's go to uh, John 10.10, 10, our, kind of our lead scripture, and I'm not going to go back and rehash a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, but I just pray that it'll be in your mind as we begin to go forward with some of the things that we're going to be saying here today. It says in the New Living Testament, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Robin, the, the thief is not an outside source. It is an inside way of thinking, a, a system of thought. Jesus, I believe, was specifically talking to the Pharisees. He was talking to the leadership. He was talking about the religious system of that day in, in John 8, 9, 10 here. Well, because what that system of thought had done has cr had created that religious system, had created all the rules, had created all the formal things that you saw through that religious system. It was right. born out of this system of thought right. that was per about performance and transaction. It was about having to do something to be able to be okay with God, that you were not enough. It was not enough that you were just created in his image. You have to do something, that system of thought. And it created this whole elaborate system that they were operating in. Judaism. Judaism. And, and Robin, and that, that is exactly what the Pharisees in that moment, you know, in the previous chapter, in chapter 9, at the end of the chapter, he's specifically addressing the Pharisees. And so this thief is what the Pharisees were peddling. They were peddling... They were peddling something from a darkened mindset, an alienated, like Colossians says, we were alienated in our own minds. Yeah. It wasn't that we were alienated from God, because no. you can't separate ourselves from God, but if you think you are, then you become what you think you are. Right. And what it was doing, it was robbing them of their intimacy yeah. with yeah. their Papa God. They could not have this intimate relationship that was surrounded by love. Instead, it was this transactional, duty-driven relationship that was out of obligation. Yeah. I mean, how many of us, I mean, I know we're talking about Judaism, but how many of us come in our own lives from that place of that's what our relationship with God looked like? Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. I know that, that we are coming out of that. We are, we are um, understanding that from a whole different perspective. And there's all different levels oh, and my. forms of that. And I don't know about you. I still see that, trying to, that, that thought process trying to like raise its um, ugly head in my subconscious and my thoughts. Even though I have a, a completely different understanding of what Papa is like now and what it is, you can still see how ingrained that is in us and that sometimes we get in certain circumstances and we still want to kind of go back to this transactional way. And I suppose really for me, it's in, I kind of want to get transactional when I'm dealing with people. I don't know. I, I mean, like yeah. when sometimes when Terry and I, you know, are working through stuff or, or we're frustrated, maybe I'm tired or, or I just don't, we don't agree with each other. We want to get real punitive. Right. I want to punish him. I want to make him feel the pain. Anybody ever done that? <laughs> Am I the only one that, that struggles with that? That comes from this mindset. It does. It is born out of that system of thought that God was punitive and that we have had to do things out of obligation. Otherwise, there would be punishment. Right. And, and listen, well, that's I, why we, most of us have come to church. Out of obligation. Out of obligation and afraid that God somehow or another wouldn't Ins bless us. Or Instead of coming out of a desire to have a relationship yeah. and a sense of community together yeah. because we find value in those relationships. At, I, I got up this morning about 6.45, a uh, little bit before that actually, and I was out at Jessica and Paul's. They're, they're, all of them are down at the beach. Without I, us. Without us. Isn't that so oh sad? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they are having fun. So uh, I was sitting there in the chair. I went out to let the uh, mow and, 
and Harley out. That's their boxers. And so they were doing their thing, and, and I gave them food. And I was just sitting there in the lawn chair in the front of the garage looking, looking out, and I was just meditating, doing some breathing and meditating and, and thinking. And all of a sudden, I kind of zoned everything out. Those of you that, some of you will understand what I'm saying. I just, everything kind of zoned out and disappeared. And God removed something this morning that I, I say he removed it. I think I became aware that it was there. And he, it was just like very gently, he took it out. And, and I recognized that that was something that I have dealt with since I was a little kid. Since a little kid, I, there's something that I've dealt with that I did not know was even there. Now, this just happened this morning, and so I believe that in the days ahead, there's going to be a, a transform, transformative change in, in my psyche and the way that I'm approaching life, because I didn't even know that that thought, I haven't even told her. And I'm not going to tell you. It's none of your business. <laughs> but he, We're just going to reap the benefits of it, is you, all I have to say. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, because there's things that have, just like the Pharisees, they were, they were peddling something that they didn't even know why or what they were peddling. Let me say this, when okay. I, as I hear you saying what you're saying, do you think that we don't even slow down enough because we are so transactional and so driven by performance that we never even slow down enough yeah. to become aware yeah. of that? I mean, that's why it's because we so feel like I have to do something, I have to do something, I have to do something, I have to do something. And that's the mindset we And I was sitting driven. in the lawn chair doing nothing. I know, but, the, <laughs> but the, because of that and because you were meditating and yeah. thinking about your relationship with God, I don't know what you were meditating or thinking about, but because you had slowed your mind down enough to be able to even hear what God was saying to you, yeah. man, and it's so easy. Oh, man, how guilty I am of that in my own life. It's, not, it's, it's just instead of when I get my, sometimes my default, and if this is you, if things get stressful, I'm going to go clean something. I'm going to go do something. I want to do something that I can control when things feel yeah. out wow. of control. Yeah. 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 And listen, but instead, probably what Papa is wanting me to do when things feel out of control is to slow down yeah. and to take a step back yeah. and to get quiet and not be afraid to hear what Papa will say to me. And because you know what he's going to say to me? He's going to say that I'm loved yeah. and that it's going to be okay yes. and that you've got this. Or he might say, yeah. you know what, let's get rid of this because this is what's causing stress in your thoughts, wow. the, you know, and, but we've got to slow down and trust him enough. It robbed them of their intimacy because what happened there yeah. came out of intimacy yeah. and relationship yeah. for you this morning. Yeah. yeah. So let's go to John five thirty nine. I know that I've read this, but I want to read all the way uh, to verse uh, 47 this morning. And then we're going to just make some comments on this. Yeah. And, um, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, the leadership, and he said, you search the scriptures, and that would have been the Old Testament scriptures, because yep. the new wasn't written yet. They were living it. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, or you have Aeonian life, life in your moment. You, th you think that what you're doing is life in the moment. What I'm showing you is life in the moment. Because you're, you're not really living life. You're, you're under bondage. You're, you're under bondage to the law and Moses. And, and it goes on to say that here. Uh, For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they, the scriptures are they, which testify of me and what I'm bringing to you. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have this life. To be open. Because what they had a hold of... They had a hold of it so strongly that they couldn't let go of something, even though the, I think maybe they were seeing life, but they, had, they were so encumbered and so in bondage to this thing that they couldn't let it go. They thought God gave them what they had. Saul, who became Paul, he, he thought God gave him what he had. And listen, and God gets in our box with us and ha because we can never be separated from God. 
and, and our performance doesn't separate us from God, he is in our box with us. He's not agreeing with us right. when we are operating right. from a place that's not true, right. but he is still there with us. And I think sometimes that in itself makes it hard because, you know, you would yeah. think of someone, um, if, you know, if God would just be a ogre and say, if you're not going to believe what I believe, I'm, I'm out of here and you are abandoned and left on your yeah. own. Right. But he doesn't abandon doesn't us do and leave us on our own. And, and because he still wants us to feel safe and love us, that process can take longer sometimes. But it's, a, it, but it's one of love and safety that it happens in instead of one of manipulation that says, because if he would abandon us to get us to, to come into the truth, That'd be manipulation. it would be. But instead, he sticks with us. Yeah. And he has all the time in the world. And it, and it the does. Ages to come. And it is a slower process. But in the end, it become, it's the healthy process place. It hel- yeah. It's a healthy way that we can come into un- our understanding of our relationship with God from the right perspective because he's not manipulating us yeah. to get there. Yeah, that's Man, awesome. I got to quit manipulating people and you and my children. And Doesn't it make you think well, how I much think we, we operate that? Well, I think we do it that? subconsciously oh gosh, without even realizing but that we're doing But that's because that's the foundation from which I came from. I, came, I was like, if I don't accept Jesus and what he did, I'm going to go to a place of eternal conscious torment. Yeah. I'm going to be abandoned by God at some point in my life. If I don't make all the right choices in my life, then yes, not that we don't re- reap the natural consequences of my life, but there's no hope for me. God's not going to help me in my natural consequences. But the truth is, is that he's even going to help me in the, in middle. My, in the middle of my yeah. natural consequences yeah. that I have. Yeah. And, you know, all those things that, or if I get sick and, you know, I'm going to think, well, I, I can't ask God to help me because I start listing off all the things I'm not doing right. And so these are, you know, it's a transaction again. And right. that's how I thought. And, and man, I still want to try to, mani- because that's what my relationship with God was born out of. I see myself doing that in my relationships yeah. with people still, even though I'm coming into a different understanding yeah. of that. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's really powerful. So it goes on to say, I do not receive honor from men, but I, I now know you that you do not have the love of God in you. And Robin, I believe they had the love of God in them. Yes. They were just not aware of it. They were not yeah. operating in it. They didn't have it in Would the Would you operate. all agree with that? Well, they didn't have it in operation in their soul right. yes. and in their yeah. mind, but yeah. they definitely They're, had that on the inside because right. there's nothing that could separate them right. from that. So it goes on to say, I have come in my Father's name or nature. That word is the character of God. I have come in my Father's name or nature. And you do not receive me if another comes in his own nature. And you do not receive me if another comes in his own name or nature. Him you will receive. How can you believe, how can you believe who receives honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you. This is Jesus. Even in the middle of this. I know. Because he's, he's, he's shown him the heart of the Father. Do not think that I shall accuse you. Let's remove the accusation. Yeah. That's what Jesus was saying. Man. I shall not accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. Moses. The law. The law. Yeah. The system. In whom you trust. You've put all of your trust in this book. And I'm standing in front of you. I've given you a little bit of insight in that book. Yeah. But you don't realize that all that insight is standing right in front of you. Yeah. You Not put your trust you. in Moses. Yep. Mm. That's so good. For, you, for if you did believe Moses, you would believe in me for he wrote about me. But Robin, again, even though Moses wrote about God, you and I were talking about some contradictory statements even in Genesis chapter 3, and we're not yeah. going to go there this right. morning. Right. But there's, there's some contradiction in Genesis chapter 3, and, and so, but even in the middle of misunderstanding and misalignment outside of the Father's nature or character, which is what Jesus was sent to show us, they, they still got glimpses and, and they saw little 
portions and pieces of that. And, and so Jesus was saying, if you would have understood, because like on the road to Emmaus, Jesus opened to the two disciples that was on the road to Emmaus. He took the Old Testament scriptures and opened, up, opened them up to them so that they could see the reality of who he was right. and how he was walking, yeah. which is pretty powerful to me. Yeah. Um, it goes on to say, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you ever believe his words? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin, I think today even most of us as believers have been locked into the law of Moses. Now, some of us have been coming into grace for, you and I have been coming into grace since the middle 80s, but, into the love of God. Yeah. But we still had a lot of attachments to the law of Moses. To a, we tried to mix part of the system, even of an angry God. We tried to pull that anger into the New Testament and have it obliterated by Jesus yeah. at the cross. But Jesus didn't have to obliterate the anger of God. Because it never existed. It never existed. He had, to, he had to obliterate. He had to go into our soul and obliterate all of the wrong mindsets that that have been in the minds of men. Yeah. And he spoiled principalities and powers. Which are all thought processes and systems of thinking that are opposite of who our Father God is. And man, we've been talking about that. We've been talking about Tara and I's own struggles. And, and I know that you guys can identify with that too, of the, the effects of those systems of thinking. So Robin, the, the, this system that Jesus was talking about was the accuser. The law of Moses was their accuser. And he said, I'm not accusing you. I've never accused you. What is accusing you is the law of Moses. The law came through Moses, John chapter 1 says, but grace and truth came yes. through Jesus Christ. Yeah. There was a reality of the character of God, of the nature of God, of, of who he was. But listen, they were struggling to op be open to a new way of thinking. Sherry and I were talking before service about this very thing. We were talking about just that sometimes we get are so afraid to think outside of the group that we've been involved with oh, or man. the teachings that we've had for maybe even generations in our family that have come up through those things. And we get afraid and we struggle to even be open, to even want to consider a different thought. And I think that is just right where they were at yeah. in, their, in, in, in their situation. And we can also find ourselves in our situation too. They had a hard time seeing Papa outside the law of Moses and the performance-based religious system of Judaism that, um, that they were in. The system, like you were saying, Terry, that system, that system of thinking was the accuser. That was what was, was accusing yeah. them and making them feel unworthy to be a child of God. To, it was, it well, they was felt accused. separated by yes. this. It was robbing them of experiencing the very life of the Father that they had right on the inside of them. Absolutely. And man, is it, you know, it is amazing how we hang on to what is familiar. I mean, and, you know, sometimes you see that, like, you know, when you see someone who's been in, like, maybe a, that it shows out real clearly. Sometimes when you see someone in a, that's been in an abusive relationship and, and because it's familiar, they either, A, stay in that relationship and don't get out of it, or maybe they uh, leave that relationship, but then they gravitate to a, another relationship that really has a the different similarities. person because it's what's familiar and because it because it's even though something can be really unhealthy and destructive it can still be what is comfortable yeah. on some sort of crazy level for us and i think this is what religion can be to us sometimes that even though we can practically say man there when we hear the difference between this system of thinking and this system of thinking and even though you're practically can say whoa that's a better system of thinking we still have a hard time being yeah. open to letting go to what is comfortable and familiar to us yeah so let's go back and revisit what we talked about about three weeks ago out of Genesis 1, uh, verses 26, 27, yeah. and 31. And so let's go back to even what Ephesians 2.10 says, we are His workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It says in Genesis 1, 26, and 27, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So Robin, what do you think about that? So this scripture obviously clearly establishes the fact that everything God created was not just good, but very Very good. good. And we are going to need to be aware of that. I know we said this a few weeks ago, that how important it is to to really look at our origin, to look at where we started. Sometimes we start from the beginning of the wrong system of thinking, yeah. Versus going well, we back be, we to begin the from right we, system of what thinking. we say is the fall. Yeah. But but even within the fall, mankind didn't lose their identity. No. And that's just, what we're saying. Yeah. No. They still had. They d- didn't change because God said they were very good. God said everything He created was good, including the serpent. Because we really address. Let's consider. And this is what we really talked about a few weeks ago. Let's consider. Yeah that the serpent is not a physical animal, but rather a metaphor for our imagination and our ability to create on our own. And it can be good when that imagination is connected to our five senses, or not to our five senses, but to who we are on the inside. Right, but it can be, go um, become bad and not good when we allow our five senses and the things that are happening on the outside to dictate what our, our imagination right. is, is, is thinking about right. and where yeah. it can take us. Absolutely. So, so let's, let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, and let me just say this. Remember, Paul was talking to the Corinthian church, and he said, I'm, I'm concerned that the way that the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness so that your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Yeah. Robin, you and I talked about this a lot yesterday as the fact that, you know, whenever things become complicated, I mean, we have to be like a little child. Whenever, so whenever we make things so complicated that we're not able to walk in something, and actually that complication, I believe, actually deceives us. And the complication it was for Eve was not believing who she was. What, what I believe Paul was doing in 2 Corinthians 11, without going into, back into great detail, is that Paul is looking at the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent as a metaphor and applying the principle of what happens to the human race. Robin, right. Adam and Eve happens to us on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we were created in a, in, a, in a place of everything being very good. And now this, is, this was my question. I had to be careful who I asked it to, but even 35 to 40 years ago, I was asking this question. Why would a good God put an evil bad creature in the garden, and my thought process was that he couldn't handle in heaven, so he kicked him out down here to bring temptation to us. Well, then that means that God would be in on the temptation. We read out of James chapter 1 that God tempts, tests, or tries no no one, one, that all of us are led away by our own desires. Then we're tempted. That desire is our physical senses coupled with our imagination that that goes in the wrong direction. Oof, that is so good. Yeah. So so Paul is telling the Corinthian church, don't be deceived the way Eve was deceived, because really, he said, you're putting up with another gospel. Paul uses that terminology in Galatians chapter 1 as well. He said, you're putting up with another gospel, which really isn't a gospel at all. All it is is mixture. If people are telling you you have to do something to become like God. Right, because he's saying don't let your minds be corrupted from the simplicity of the mindset and the way of thinking that Christ was bringing. Yes. Because he was bringing, moving them from this transactional view of God to this familial view of God and about being about a relationship with a father and not about obligation and transaction. Yeah. And man especially in their moment, yeah. they kept people kept wanting them to come back. To the law, to the because law of Moses. I'm sure they were probably like us that maybe have moved out of, and I know I've thought this, or people had said this to us as we were really taking a different view of the doctrine of hell and really um, looking at it from a different perspective than what we had been raised in. People would be like, what if you're wrong? 
about what you're thinking. What if, what if yeah. there really is right. a hell? And you're, you're talking about something, and, and then you're just, the, their thought process was, you're going to go to hell just for that, yeah. for teaching that. Yeah, you know what I mean? I'm going I mean, to hell for I'm, talking about it. And I'm sure those that had come out of Judaism, as those were, people were trying to get them to come back up under that transactional way of thinking, they were probably thought, oh, what if we're wrong? What if we do need to fulfill all the laws? What if I do need to go and make the sacrifice and, that they had done for generations? What if I need to go kill the lamb so that my sins are covered? What if I'm not all right with God, like Jesus was saying? What if, so Paul addresses that in the book of Hebrews. Oh my goodness. Go yeah. back. Don't go back to the simplicity. Uh, don't move away from the simplicity of what came through Christ and what he was teaching. Absolutely. And I'm going to make this statement, so you might want to hold my hand while I make it, is that this whole problem with another gospel would be solved all, almost immediately if we removed the financial aspect from it. Yeah, man. It if is. we removed, see, because Robin and I, whether or not anybody comes to Turning Point Church, we're going to keep doing this. Right. Whether or not anybody embraces, we're going to keep doing this. But, but here, here's the deal, is that I'm not controlled by money. Right. And you say, well, if no money comes in, then we won't do this. But right. there's a lot of people that I know that are so afraid of even saying some of the little details that Robin and I are saying today because they might lose their church. They might lose the people in their church. Their, pe their people may not. I, every time I get up here, I think, well, there's a possibility that somebody's not going to embrace what I'm saying. And you could walk out and go away. But you can't serve God and money. Right. And, and, you know, and, right. and to exist corporately like this takes money yes. to exist corporately. And so if, if the people that are coming find value in coming together there corporately, yeah. then there will, the finances will be there. And Terry and I every day have to tell ourselves and remind ourselves not to go up underneath the system of thinking about the traditional religious way of looking at the church yes. yeah. and that, that we will, that is God or bust. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and either God's going to bring people together right. that want this, and then the finances will be there, and we will continue to be able to exist together as a church family like this, or they won't. But, but, it, but listen, because it's not about money. This message should never be about money. We should not charge this message. And, and that's what I feel like sometimes we've done with the tithe and, and money, that we've made, we have put pressure on people to give and made this about charging for the message. And man, I, I could, wow. that is not how God operated. No. That's not how Jesus operated. And that is not that the gospel is, that is a transaction. That is a cash transaction, right. and God is not about that. He wants us to give as cheerful givers from the, from the fact that our yeah. hearts have been touched by something, and we want to exist and have that exist and be a part of that, Absolutely. but not as a transaction out of obligation. Absolutely. So we're, we're going to exist. We're going to exist because we have jobs outside the church. And again, you know, uh, I, I understand I understand that I've been doing this for a couple of days. I understand the whole concept of support and partnership and community. Right. And, but, but Robin, uh, you know, we've allowed money to, to control even the aspect of us saying something right. that we knew has been right for a long time. Yep. But, but if, if nobody embraces it, then what are we going to do? Yeah. But if we don't, if we take money out of the equation. Then, then you're free to say what you need to say at, at the level that you need to say it. But let, but let me say this. Some people's currency isn't money. Okay. What's your currency? What's my currency sometimes? Mm. Sometimes my currency can be I want you to like me okay. and accept me. Wow. So I'm not going to say something that or step out, even if they bring up the conversation. Because I don't believe we, have, we should force our, what right. we believe on other people. But right. even if the, it arises, maybe I don't say it because I'm too afraid I won't get that currency of love and acceptance back yeah. from you. What are you going to think about me? Right. I mean, the currency isn't always cash. 
The currency is a lot of things. That's really good. And listen, we need to let go of whatever that transaction is, and we need to feel safe enough. It's kind of like what we talked, that Jesus did not go around trying to prove who he was. He yeah. just allowed people to right. experience. He, that we feel so safe in who we are, even though someone asked me a question about what I believe, and I might say it, and they might not like it, and they could reject it. That's okay, because I don't have to, I'm not looking for a currency of acceptance from them to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to validate what I believe. Right. And for years, uh, David, you and I have talked about this a lot. For years, you know, I, I haven't given altar calls. And I'm not objectionable to altar calls. But if you go back in church history and look at how they begin, you might be objectionable right. to altar calls because it was all negative. And, and so at the end of my message, I would have people come to accept Jesus or get filled with the Holy Ghost or whatever, or healed. Or, but the, the deal was that I needed validation yeah. I needed validation. I don't need validation. I've already got validation. What I'm trying to do is give you validation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Not give me validation. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That's good. Yep. That so good. so let's, let's go over to Genesis 3, Robin, and I want to read again about uh, at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. This is just a metaphor. He's, right. he's talking about uh, our... Are, uh, uh, whenever it says the beast of the field, it's the, the field is the mind. It's our mind. Yep. And so this is just a metaphor talking about the mind. So the serpent, your five physical senses coupled, coupled with your imagination, imagination. Uh, your five, God gave that and it was very good. It wasn't an evil creature sent to destroy us. It, it was something very good. We took it and made it into something that it shouldn't have been. When we walk outside of our awareness of who we are, that because our five physical senses are experiencing things all the time. We're not yes. saying that there's a denial of those. Well, but we're he saying we created it for our pleasure and, for, our desire. and for our own good. Right. But it is about experiencing our imagination, our five physical senses. From the foundation and our awareness of who we are in our oneness with God, and that our five physical senses are not defining us. And that, I think, is what we flipped. It's right. like we began, and I think that's what happened. Our imagination began to say, this is what defines me, instead of me experiencing this out here and allowing this to be what defines me. And then I'm filtering what I'm experiencing out here through the definition of who I already am in right. Christ yeah. and who I are in my oneness with right. God. Yeah. And instead of letting my five physical senses it, tell me who I am. Yeah. And it's like we, had, we got our imagination went in the complete wrong direction. Yeah, it went wild. So... Um, it goes on to say, uh, and he said to the woman, and it almost sounds like an entity on the outside because of the, the, so way, the way that he's it reads describing and yeah. what we think about that. But, 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 but let's think about that going on in our mind. It is like a personification of something that's because alive. Our, do your thoughts feel alive to you sometimes? And your emotions no and your question. imagination? Mine do. I yep. mean, it could, it, it could be powerful. Yeah. I could meditate and think on something to the point that even if it's false and not real, it is like real in, in what I'm feeling right? and what right. I'm experiencing. And then I'm going to start acting on it yeah. like it's real. And then yeah. I actually am going to create something in the natural right. to happen. Yeah. So, and it goes on to say, uh, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And I believe that was just, uh, again, a metaphor for a message. Yes. And the woman said to the serpent, uh, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it nor touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will, you will be like God knowing good and evil. She was already like God, Robin. Yep. Her physical sp senses spoke to her imagination, and her, her imagination brought accusation. Wow. Wow. Your imagination can bring accusation. Yes. Yes. 
So, so she bought into the lie that she was not like God. Our imagination, our physical senses can create desires that create thoughts that tells us that we have to add something to who we are to improve ourselves, to be like God, to be like uh, to to be like God, to be worthy, yep. and 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 the truth is um, that I'm already worthy. Yes, yeah. I'm already accepted. Yeah. I'm already loved. But and then the church has bled into that system. Yeah. To try to control Judaism, people. Christianity, yeah. and we we've been manipulative and yeah. power hungry and money hungry and and all of these things. It it, it because we we've operated from an outside uh, system yeah. that has touched our senses that has caused our imagination to go in the wrong way. But if if something goes in the wrong way. I can, I can allow something to happen to me that would go to, to the right way. Yeah. Listen, desires that lead us into a different system of thinking that cause us to buy in to a mistaken identity. Because that's yeah. what happens when we try to say, when our five senses, we imagine that those are what are telling us who we are. We buy in to a mistaken identity identity yeah. instead of believing that we were created loved chosen and accepted by our papa god yeah robin any gospel any gospel good news that says you are not like god is a different gospel than what jesus was revealing yes. all the gospel does is make light of the truth of who you are that's yeah. what the gospel does yeah and once you begin to operate from that identity, yeah. then your physical life begins to take on the, the dynamics of who you are, your dominion, your authority, who you are as love. You begin to operate from that place and out of your mind. And don't you think when you really begin to operate from that place and you are, then your imagination, when, it, when you're dealing with the five physical senses, you're going to be imagine solutions. You're going to imagine um, overcoming and ways to solve things instead of having something, facing something difficult with your five senses and then just giving up and feeling defeated. Instead, you're going to allow your imagination to problem solve and to find ways and how to yes. respond to it and what to do instead of feeling like, it's all over. Right. And then I just yeah. have to accept this and feeling like a failure. Because, Robin, whenever one thing stops, sometimes the thing that stops in our life gives us the platform to move into the next thing that God wants for us. Sometimes we look at failure like, well, that was really terrible. But sometimes that failure it helps us give us a platform to move to the next thing. Maybe we could have got there without the failure. I'm not saying right. that, that we have right. to fail, but I believe a lot of times whenever something, something stops, Judaism stopped. Judaism became the platform for us to move into the reality of what Jesus wanted us to move yep. into. Yep. That's powerful. That's good. That is good. So uh, I, I love uh, Matthew 16, 23. We've looked at it, but I want to say it again. In uh, Matthew 16, 23, it says, But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but you're mindful of the things of men. So we've been looking at the fact that the thief is not a physical entity, Satan, the devil, an, an outside force like that is... That is comparable to God's force. Wow. Right. There's nothing, there's nothing. We, yeah. we, in, we take something and create darkness, but God is still light. Yeah. We, we take our creative power and go in a wrong direction, but yeah. we don't have to go in that wrong yeah. direction. Yeah. The Pharisees could have t embraced what Jesus was saying and moved out of that system of thought into something far greater. Some of them did. Yeah, they A did. lot of them did not. Yep. Um, so Satan is, Satan is being mindful of the things of men instead of the things of God. And then in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. We thought that, that we, it's kind of like that one scripture says, we're beating something that doesn't even exist. We're fighting, we're fighting the air. But all who were oppressed of the devil, we thought there was a physical something coming against oh us. For, and Jesus was healing all who were oppressed of, 
of the devil, and the devil, the word the devil in the, in the Greek means the accuser. Yeah. It, it's talking about the Mosaic law, what we just read earlier. The devil for them and their moment, because this wasn't even written to us, the devil for them and their moment was the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the things that they were peddling through the Mosaic law. This system of thought that said that our Papa was judicial, angry, and punitive. The system of thought that said that we are not worthy, that we are not made very good. And Robin, we are still struggling with systems of thought. The devil, the accuser. But most of us have thought that it was an outside force. But this system of thought is the devil, the accuser. All of these terminologies is talking not about an entity, but about a, a system of thought that we have drawn on that... that uh, and that, that we have not understood where our origin lies. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what is the accuser to us? Yeah. I mean, what is, I mean, we see what the, what the uh, Judaism had created. And I think if we've been in the uh, church, depending on how you were raised, religion could be the accuser to us, just like Judaism was is. But, well, Robin, but even for people that have been outside of the church, and even sometimes, even though we are coming outside of this performance-based system, what, is, what are we still struggling with accusing us? Do we have something that's still bringing accusation against us? Well, Robin, I, us? I allowed the Bible. I, I thought the Holy Spirit. I, I remember uh, whenever I began to see that the Holy Spirit was the comforter that God was the comforter. I, I believe most of my life that he was the one that was reigning condemnation in my life. He was coming to straighten me out. It, it, and, absolutely. and I used the Bible to look at it like that because that's what people had told me. But you know, for me, even though I've, I have, feel like I have moved away from that, I think what accuses me are the things I can't control. Hmm. So things, people I love that I see struggling or things in my own personal life that I'm huh. struggling to control. And that accuses me of sometimes not being enough. The things that I can't, even though I know God loves me, obviously, if I'm alive, that to accuse me at some level, I'm not embracing that and walking hmm. in the awareness wow. of that, even yeah. as I'm saying that. But for yeah. me, that's where I, that at the real level for Robin, that is what I really have to work against. The things that I cannot control in my life, the things that I cannot change, whether I see my child struggling with something and I, <clears throat> and that feels outside of my control, or I see myself internally struggling with, with something, a habit or something that I'm wanting to do better at, or be better at, or something at work that I can't can't control or something that's going on, <clears throat> that is sometimes what tries to accuse me of not being enough because I feel like I should be able to do something about it. And then I have to remind myself that I am enough right. and that God didn't intend me to control everything around me and that it's okay if there's people that are struggling around you because he loves them and he's in their boat with them and he is on their journey with them. And it's okay if I didn't... Um, get all the things on my checklist accomplished this week. And that makes me feel bad. God's reminding me, you're okay. You, you're not your checklist. It's not what you right. do. It's not a transaction, Robin. I love you. And just constantly being aware of that. But for me, and I don't, and everybody might be different, right. but for me, in a real practical way, that can be the accuser to me. And I have to just constantly allow myself to slow down enough to be aware of who I am yeah. and yeah. not fall in to wanting to do something more to try to gain control over the things that are out of control. That's powerful. That's powerful. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed yes. to this world this way uh, this age this way of thinking and robin he was paul was Judaism. writing to them and whenever he said this do not be conformed to this world he was talking about their age the, in, in the greek this word uh, aeon is the age of the law the age of that the the union you and i looked at this in the greek yesterday yeah. the union the union with an outside external influence don't be conformed. Don't be. Yeah. Uh, don't don't uh, hold to the same pattern pattern of thinking. 
an, an outer external thought press. Do not be conformed to this world age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, Robin, this word transformed is the word metamorphosis. And uh, this, is, this is whenever a, a butterfly crawls up on a limb and wraps itself in a cocoon and it comes out the butterfly. The caterpillar was always the butterfly. Yeah, think about that. About the caterpillar was always the butterfly. Are we just going to begin to walk in who we are? Are we going to allow our mindset to change and us start living from the inside out and be like that caterpillar that transforms into that butterfly that was in it because all Because that's along. who we are. Because that is who we are. We are loved, accepted, chosen. We are enough. And our five senses are not dictating or changing whether that's true about us or not. Right. But because that's true about us, we're going to dictate how we look at our five senses and, and look at how we approach our world around us. So, so don't be conformed to, he was telling them, don't be conformed to your age, your system of thought. Yeah. See, I, I, we, I used, we used to preach these scriptures like, don't be conformed to this world. Don't drink or cuss or... Uh, transaction, transaction, you transaction. Know, don't do these things. <laughs> don't be conformed to this world. Be holy. But that isn't what it was talking about at all. He was Wait, saying to them, you. don't be conformed to this age or the system of thinking because this whole age and system of thinking, it is about to go away. Wow. Yep. And it did. Jesus hung it on the cross. And then in that generation, 40 years later, Jerusalem fell. Judah fell. The temple fell. There, G, all of Jesus' prophecies that, that he was warning them about what was coming because of this transactional thinking, it came to pass. Jesus was not a false prophet. He, he, what he said happened, and it's not happening in our moment. It happened 2,000 years ago. But let's just think about it. Judaism didn't create that thought process. No. That thought process, as we looked at, this, at Adam and Eve and, the, and the metaphor of that, that is, that is the system of thinking that is the temptation of mankind and will always be the temptation wow. of us to fall into. And Judaism was the picture of what it can grow into if we don't allow ourselves to follow the system of thinking that Christ came and represented, we could yeah. fall right back into our own version of what that looks yeah, like in our yeah, lives. And it yeah. probably looks a little bit different for sure each one of us, but we can have that same version of, of being transactional and punitive toward ourselves and toward other people and thinking that we're not enough. But God is saying that we do not have to. That Just like that age was coming to an end, God wants it to come to an end for us in our moment every day. Yeah, that's powerful. So let's go over to 1 Peter uh, 5.8. This is a very familiar scripture. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Ooh. Man, we quoted that all over the place in the charismatic movement, the word of faith movement. <laughs> we he, couldn't have church without this devil. He prowls around. He's prowling around. Like a roaring right lion looking to, for someone to devour. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The system of thought, Robin, was like a roaring lion. The, the Sanhedrin, the, the, uh, the, the leadership of Jesus' day, the people that were alive whenever Peter was writing this, I believe he was talking about that religious system. It was going about, and literally, they were killing people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Saul was one of these people before he became Paul. They were lit. It was like a roaring lion, but that roaring lion is still in our pulpits. Still in our heads. It's still in our even, heads. Just, even if it's, even if we're not a part of where it's being in our pulpit, sometimes it's still in our own head, whether you're sitting in a church or not. But what I'm saying is I believe that it's, it's, it's coming from our pulpits. I believe that Revelation talks about the tail of the scorpion stinging. It's, it's that roaring lion. It's trying to devour you in your thinking if I tell you opposite of who you are and what you have. It is a roaring lion, and it's, it, it's, he, he's, he's, that's part of that thief system. And, and listen, that system, that roaring lion, was seeking to devour the message of Christ and the message that he brought to them. 
That's what Peter was saying. The message of love, acceptance, inclusion. The accuser, the devil, was the law. The law of Moses to the Jews. They were coming out of that. uh, Some of them were coming out of that system of thought. And, and, but many of them stayed within that system. And that system was saying, if your performance isn't enough, you better go sacrifice another animal. Because it demanded punishment. It demanded transaction. And they were pressured to go back up underneath that performance-based system of thinking. But I'm telling you, as we get ready to close here, so are you. So am I. We are pressured. To go back up underneath a system that is opposite of grace, that is opposite of favor, that is opposite of acceptance, because, that is opposite of inclusion. Because even even let's just think outside of the realm of the church. I know that 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 we that we've struggled in the religious system even of today, operating from this place. But our culture just wants us to be performance Thrives driven. On that. It yeah. is our culture is all about self improvement. Our culture is all about climbing the ladder and finding your value and worth for through the type of home you live in, through the yeah. type of job that you have, through the type of car that you drive. And we can fall into that system of thinking even it is even just even outside the yes, church. because it is just comes from the or it comes because God gave us an imagination that was very good and we can be led if we're led by our five senses just like the metaphor about Eve in the garden if we're led by those five senses then it is going to take our imagination in a place that's opposite of the awareness of who God has already made us to be and we're going to allow those things to define us instead of God yes. himself on the inside of us to define us that's powerful yep so fear can create imaginations that will lead us back into a system of thinking. That's what was going on in their day, but that's what's going on in our moment. That tells us that we are unworthy, that we have to do something to make ourselves better so we can be lovable, to be enough, to be loved by Papa. And, and what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden, Robin, is they put fig leaves on them. They tried to do something. To... They tried to do something to cover up, but yep. God said to them, who told you you were naked? Yeah. Who told you you were separated from Who told me? you you weren't Who enough? told you you weren't loved? Who made you feel exposed? Mm. So the fig leaf, which is a type of the law, is man's attempt to cover up our mindset of worthiness, unworthiness, and, and, and what you were saying a while ago is that all of us tend to do different things to, yeah. to, to bring that about. Um, our, our unworthiness comes as a result of us conceiving something in our imagination that we are not enough. But the truth is, if, if that happens, then we can take our imaginations and, and be aware and connected to the source, to who we are in Christ. Yeah. And that, our five senses can begin to be energized to bring about things that are positive rather than in a negative right. sense. Yep. That's so good. Terry, I love what Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was at all points tempted as we are without sin. You know, I can imagine that Jesus experienced anxiety, fear, because if he was touched, right? I mean, it just says that. If he was touched with that, and I think sometimes we think, well, he, he didn't never, experience all of right. that. Well, I don't think that that's true at all. I think he did. His senses picked up on all of that. I think he experienced those things in his emotions, but he chose to respond to life from the awareness of his oneness Absolutely. with the Father rather than his five senses. Yeah. Living life from the inside out instead of from the outside in. So Jesus' imagination was connected to an internal voice, That's an so internal relationship. He was led from the inside out instead of the outside in. He was led by the Spirit of God. He was a son of God, so he was led by the Spirit of God. Which was he, in him. he wasn't led by a book. Matter of fact, he reinterpreted the book. Yeah, if he would have been led like that book, he would have been going down the same path that Judaism was on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So he was not moved by outside circumstances when his five senses were experiencing things. Yeah. He went internal, yeah. and he was able to operate from this internal place. Yeah. And he showed us how to operate 
from that internal place. And I want to read one more scripture here. Right. Oh, I got it right, right here. here. Yep. Um, out of the New King James, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, our physical senses. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, flesh, physical senses, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And I'm going to come back here next week as we as I end next week, casting down arguments, imaginations, the King James says, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, that's amazing, and we'll get back in here. But I want to read this out of the Mirror Bible. I love this. The fact that we are living in a physical world in human bodies of flesh does not mean that we engage ourselves in a combat combat dictated to by the typical tit-for-tat strategies of the politics of the day. <laughs> the dynamic of our strategy is revealed in God's ability to disengage mindsets and perceptions that have held people captive in pseudo-fortresses wow. for centuries. <laughs> Every lofty idea and argument positioned against the knowledge of God, His character, is cast down and exposed to be a mere invention of our own imagination. imagination. <laughs> wow. We arrest every thought that could possibly trigger an opposing threat to our redeemed identity <laughs> and the and innocence at spear point is what he says <laughs> the caliber of our weapon is empowered by the revelation of the ultimate consequence of the obedience of Christ our ears are fine-tuned to echo the voice of likeness that resonates within us. We are acquainted with the articulate detail of the authentic language of our origin. Wow. That is good. That is good. Man, we are one with him. That, that, is, that is the accuser that we remove. We remove yeah. those accusations, those yes. things, those thoughts, those systems of thinking that say that we are not enough and that we are not who God says we are. Then we go back to our origin and our origin is, is that we are chosen before time began. We were loved. We were picked out. We had nothing to do with it. God made us. He designed us. He, ident he gave us our identity yeah. and anything that comes against it or tries to accuse that, we Take it at spear point. We take it at spear point and get it out. <laughs> yep, yep. Isn't that awesome? That is good. Yep. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the people that are listening online today yes. and those that are, will listen to this. And, Father, the people that are in this room, yes. we thank you, Father, for the consistency and the congruency yep. of the gospel. We thank you for Jesus showing us who you were and what you were like and that we were one, that we've always been one. And Father, I thank you that we are coming into the reality of that oneness and all of our thought processes that are opposite of that. Father, I thank you that they are being removed. I thank you, Father, that you are ministering to our lives in a powerful way. And Father, that people will want what we are walking in, yeah. not just what we're talking about, yeah. but what we're walking in. Yeah. And Father, I thank you that we're going to stay congruent and consistent in our maneuvering forward. You're helping us with that. And I thank you for that. Jesus, we so love you. Yeah. We so thank you that you did everything that you did to bring us into this reality. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have, Have a, a wonderful day. Have a great week, yep. guys.